C'est un grand plaisir pour moi et un honneur d'introduire les premiers intervenants d'aujourd'hui, Jean-Marie Schaeffer, qui ouvre justement les colloques Les Sensibles à l'œuvre, dont, comme je viens de dire, la matinée est consacrée à la neuroesthétique d'un point de vue critico-méthodologique. Alors, présenter le travail de Jean-Marie Schaeffer ici serait avant tout un geste naïf. Ses recherches ne sont pas seulement bien connues, mais c'est justement, euh, Fernando vient de, le, vient de le dire, c'est justement grâce à un travail comme les siens qu'il euh, qu peut avoir un colloque comme celui que Fernando Vidal et moi euh, nous avons imaginé. Je pense notamment à euh, deux de ses ouvrages, Adieu l'esthétique, publié en 2000, et La fin de euh, l'exception humaine, paru en 2007. Alors, dans la pensée de, de Jean-Marie Schaeffer, on peut trouver deux positions majeures, je pense. D'une part, euh, vous considérez que de nombreuses questions posées dans les champs philosophiques relèvent en réalité de la compétence des sciences et qu'un jour, certaines spéculations philosophiques apparaîtront vaines parce que les, les questions auxquelles elle essaie de répondre seront tranchées par les sciences. La question devient alors, pour nous aujourd'hui, est-ce que la neuroesthétique ne témoigne pas justement de ces relais que les sciences dures, et en particulier les sciences de la vie, auraient pris par rapport aux sciences humaines Personnellement, je ne crois pas, mais il serait très important d'écouter la position de Jean-Marie Schaeffer à ces sujets. D'autre part, vous, vous nous indiquez par ailleurs que toute forme de dualisme est mal pensée et qu'il faut viser une vision intégrée de l'homme, comme vous le dites. Et l'idée même d'un mind-body problem euh, dans la neuroesthétique semble être, pour certains aspects, euh, l'expression proviendrait alors d'une erreur épistémique. Alors, dans la perspective de notre colloque, ce qui est premièrement un jeu est l'espace qu'une esthétique empirique euh, a et doit avoir dans les débats philosophiques contemporains, en sachant qu'il s'agit en même temps d'une question ancienne, sinon fondatrice de l'esthétique en tant que telle, dont Baumgarten est l'un des pères fondateurs. Il s'agit en fait de penser ce qu'il advient de l'esthétique comme étude de l'aesthésis dès lors que la science du cerveau devient une science des sensations et des émotions. Sans plus attendre, je cède la parole à Jean-Marie Schaeffer qui donnera sa conférence, qui est notre première key lecture, A Plea for Aesthetic Experience en anglais. Et le débat qui s'en suivra pourra bien évidemment se dérouler dans les deux langues, en français comme en anglais. Merci beaucoup, Chiara. Merci d'être venu. Donc, à partir de maintenant, je vais parler en mauvais anglais. Um, so I, sorry for my, for my English, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's better for me uh, this morning to switch to, to that language. Um, so I, I won't talk directly about your aesthetics. Um, and um, um, I don't really know if your aesthetics is a war name or not. Um, what I'm interested in is, interested in is uh, aesthetic experience as a sort of common sense notion uh, and also a common sense family of events, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, what we could say today about uh, uh, aesthetic experience. So it's a plea for, for something. Um, I am assuming that the term aesthetic can be uh, constructed notionally so that it allow, allows us to identify a specific type of experience. This was already Kant's hypothesis, and the idea has resurfaced again and again in philosophical aesthetics too. Of course, it has also been much criticized. Most of the critics think that the very idea of aesthetic experience prevents us from getting a true understanding of art. This criticism has been formulated by continental philosophy as well as by analytical philosophy, although on different grounds. I will bypass for today, this criticism, but I wanted only to tell you that they exist. Admittedly, the expression aesthetic experience or any semantically equivalent paraphrase in some other language or some other culture will probably activate different ideas in different individuals at different times and in different groups or cultures. But I think it is reasonable to assume that all situations 
that we today commonly describe as aesthetic or would accept to describe this way share at least two characteristics. The first is that all aesthetic experiences are attentional activities. Engaging in an aesthetic relationship is paying attention to this or to that, reading a poem, listening to music, contemplating a garden or whatever. I take this to imply that to engage in an aesthetic experience means to engage in a cognitive relationship. But of course nobody would like to say that all cognitive acts are aesthetic acts. So how can we distinguish aesthetic experience from other attentional activities? Following Kant and some others, I opt for the hypothesis that attention alone is not sufficient to have an aesthetic experience. Although I will try to argue that when cognition is activated in an aesthetic setting, it has a very specific profile, there still is something more to aesthetic experience than this specific profile of the dynamics of attention. So what is the second element? Well, it seems that in all experiences which we would accept to describe as aesthetic, the attentional activity is drawn into a feedback loop with satisfaction or dissatisfaction. This hedonic component has been recognized by almost everybody taking a serious look at the question. Even if some would be unhappy with the words pleasure or satisfaction, some would prefer to talk of appreciation, evaluation, grading, and so on. On my level of analysis, I think all this boils down to satisfaction, which boils down to hedonic valence, positive or negative. Of course, I don't want to suggest that satisfaction or hedonic valence is the last word about aesthetic experience, but I think it's a very important component. I agree also that as it stands, this definition doesn't take us very far. And of course, it is not new. It is largely a reformulation of what Kant had to say in the famous first paragraph of the Analytik des Schönen in the Critique of Judgment. But I don't think that it is vacuous. Hopefully it catches in a more or less satisfactory way the array of phenomena which we want to take into account when we are looking for something which could reasonably be called aesthetic experience. This being said, we must of course be able to give more content to the two aspects of our tentative definition, the attentional aspect and the hedonic aspect. Aesthetic attention. Let me begin with this so the first element. How does the pragmatical setting, which we call aesthetic experience, affect the dynamics of attention? What are the inflections that characterize the attentional processes occurring in an aesthetic setting compared to those occurring in more standard attentional processes? The notion of a standard attentional process is problematic. But for my purpose, this is not very important because I will not say anything specific about it. I use it loosely as a contrasting element for the traits which I take to be specific of the attention in an aesthetic context. What I have to say about this specificity draws partly on cognitive psychology. And I will be unable here to go into the specifics of the experimental settings or to discuss the legitimacy of extrapolating from these settings. But in a general way, I think that the generalization from the experimental results to the context of aesthetically oriented attention can be justified on grounds of commonly accepted and commonsensically formulated characteristics of this aesthetic experience. I would, for today, like to foreground uh, five specificities without pretending that these five are the only ones. A first uh, specificity seems to me that the aesthetic inflection of attention results in a reversal uh, of the importance of bottom-up information processing compared to top-down processing. All things being equal, standard pragmatic information processing puts more emphasis on stimulus-driven bottom-up treatments than does aesthetically inflected information retrieval, which seems to be more heavily attention-driven, so top-down. I think it, it's important not to construct this as a dichotomy. Every attentional process is, of course, stimulus-driven, and every attentional process is also partly attention-driven. Looking in an aesthetic way at the picture, for example, does it neutralize the pre-attentional stages of visual organization? 
What happens is that standard attention, which is driven by the norm of perceptual and cognitive economy, does maximize these automatic bottom-up processes, and that in settings of ecological familiarity, the information processing is often phenomenologically poor because it is founded, or it takes place, uh, or is founded on acquired expertise. This is not the case of aesthetically oriented attention. It emphasizes, on the contrary, the attention-driven top-down processing. The fact that in aesthetically inflected experience, attention-driven processing becomes more important than stimulus-driven one does not imply that the stimulus, let's say an artwork or whatever, is less important in the first type of attention. In fact, perhaps it's the contrary. A second point is uh, that self that aesthetic, aesthetically, sorry, inflected uh, attention has some sort of self-teleological uh, component. I think perhaps to understand what this, what I mean by that self-teleological, uh, I have to correct what I just said. Because, of course, not all non-aesthetic attentional processes are operating like the, stand, like the standard attention somewhat artificially opposed to aesthetically inflected attention. For example, hard-looking processes do also exist in many other contexts. Think about an entomologist or botanist looking for specimens of an unknown species, or less exotically, think about a person looking for a displaced item. I think what is peculiar to the aesthetic inflection of attention is not the bare fact that it is in an important way attention-driven, but that it has a dynamics of peculiar self-teleology built into it. The aim we pursue when we are looking aesthetically at something is the ongoing process of looking itself. The entomologist looking for specimens of un unknown species is hard looking because he is aiming to categorize the characteristics which will allow him to identify the specimen as belonging to species A or B. So his attention driven hard looking is still a looking which strives for, in some way, the most economical way to achieve this result, which means that his attentional processes are guided by the final, or a final result he wants to come at, the correct identification of the specimen. This, it seems, is not the situation when attention is aesthetically inflected. If I adopt the aesthetical stance or outlook towards a flower, a sound, a picture, and so on, my activity is not driven in the same way by the transitive aim of identifying it correctly as the flower A, the sound of K, or the representation of something Z or whatever. Of course, such an identification is often part of the aesthetic process. But once you have achieved this goal of identification, the process is not over. One could even say that it is now that it really begins. Take the example of a painting, let's say, a nativity. Once you have identified its subject, the fact that it is a nativity, we will not withdraw your attention. On the contrary, you will go back, you will go, sorry, on to look at the picture or at the painting, descending beneath the level of representational identification, looking for the visual organization, the balance of colors, then perhaps ascending again to the representational level or to a symbolic level, putting the colors in relation with the content and so on. This is what I mean when I speak of the self-teleology uh, of aesthetically inflected attention. <coughs> perhaps a third point would be <coughs> that attention-driven information retrieval in aesthetic context and outside of aesthetic context <coughs> uh, sharpens, sharpens sorry, our capacities of discrimination. Be they perceptual, categorical, or emotional. This means that the practice of aesthetically oriented attention, even when it is not producing object knowledge in the canonical sense, can enhance our cognitive abilities. For example, at the perceptual level, aesthetically inflected uh, attention uh, is, in a, is a way to achieve what psychologists call, sorry, I try to find my next, uh, okay, this is the third one, what psychologists uh, call perceptual learning. I put some uh, bibliographical items, I have no time to, to talk about them, but you can, can look at them if you are interested. 
Perceptual learning is not acquisition of a new object knowledge, but results in the lowering of the threshold of attention. Lowering of the threshold of attention is a typical outcome of top-down driven processes. It has been studied notably in the area of video games. I give one a text by Sean Green and Daphne Bavelier, which has become famous. Action video game modifies visual selective attention. Uh, <clears throat> But it is a more general process corresponding to what the two psychologists, Merav Ahisar and Saul Horstein, call the reverse hierarchy theory, which is the third one in my geographical uh, uh, notices. Their idea is that what limits performance in the field of simple visual discrimination is not that the relevant information is absent from neural representations, but that neophytes do not have access to it. In other words, the subject differ on, in terms, in terms sorry, uh, of their ability or inability to attentionally access this information. Aysa and Torstein at least try to show that the training of attentionally guided top-down information retrieval lowers the threshold of our attentional access and so enables us to reach further down in the hierarchy of information retrieval, which in return enhances our capacities of discrimination. In the realm of painting, attention-driven top-down perceptual processing develops notably the capacity of the onlooker to adapt, adopt sorry, the so-called pictorial vision stance, which is based on a fine-grained discrimination of design features of the painting. And I think it plays also a very important role in the development of expertise of connoisseurship in visual art. Perceptual learning, by the way, is mostly implicit, but it is an important aspect of aesthetically inflected attention. A fourth, fourth point would uh, be the following one. Uh, dynamics of aesthetic exploration appears to be characterized by a prevalence of a multi-directional distributed exploration versus focalized and vertically integrated exploration of uh, phenomena. Standard cognitive processes use preferentially speedy bottom-up processing to arrive at efficient beliefs and evaluations in the least costly way. Specifically, when we encounter a perceptual stimulus, we try to associate it in the most economical way with a maximum of non-occurrent properties, which means properties which do not belong, belong sorry, to the perception itself, but which allow us to integrate it into a larger category. This generalization uh, operates um, through a process known as schematizing, sorry, a process which impoverishes in some way the potential complexity and richness of the stimulus by projecting upon it an internal, internalized general pattern or category and by ascribing to the perceived event these categorical attributes. It's Sometimes we speak of cognitive pattern or template, Sollmuster in German or Superzeichen. All these things are types of shortcuts, allowing us to minimize the cost of cognitive processing and to maximize its effectiveness, all other things being equal. Of course, this mechanism operates not only at the level of perception. It also plays a central role in conceptual categorization uh, taken on itself, where it has been studied under various names, such as conceptual scheme, prototype, but also horizon of expectation. It has been studied by many disciplines, not only cognitive psychology or social psychology or sociology of knowledge, but also by descriptive phenomenology and hermeneutics. When att attention operates in the context of an aesthetic experience, things are different. Instead of a dynamics bent upon reducing the complexity of information on all levels, um, it is bent um, to, it, it tries, it, or it looks for multiple top-down as well as bottom-up relationships between the different levels of information processing, and it accepts to linger on the same level and to explore this level ho horizontally in all its richness. So this property of uh, aesthetic attention has been studied notably by uh, Roman Ingarden uh, in, uh, in aesthetics. He called it uh, polyphony, a, a term which you find also in, by Bakhtin, but in another uh, understanding. But 
Ingarden thought that polyphony, that means the idea, the, the tendency to engage in at different levels uh, of the object is typically of uh, aesthetically oriented uh, attention. A last aspect about which I will say uh, some word is um, that aesthetically oriented uh, attention um, is characterized by an acceptance of what is called by psychologists cognitive dissonance. Standard attention converges rapidly in the most economical way on a fixation of stable perceptual, conceptual or affective beliefs, whereas aesthetic attention cultivates the capacity to sustain cognitive divergence and delayed categorization. In other words, we do not rush to the conclusion. Or to rephrase it somewhat differently, to enjoy attention in an aesthetically inflected way, we must be able to accept states of cognitive dissonance and delayed categorization. Experimental studies have shown, for example, that people who, during standard linguistic communication processes, tend to pay attention also to, for example, the phonetic level of the message, to the timbre of the voice and so on, are in a relevant way, statistically relevant way, more attracted to poetry than people who in standard linguistic communication discard these base levels, um, uh, aspects, or to be more precise, who pay only covered attention to those levels and limit their focalized attention to the level of semantics. The delayed categorization, as the case of poetry shows, comes, of course, with a profit. It enriches the meaning in the end, um, by feeding lower level characteristics into it. For example, by interpreting differences in the sound structure as embodying supplementary meaning differences. But delayed categorization also comes with a cost. You must accept to delay fixation of belief. I speak here only of the, what happens on the side, of course, of the receptor, but I should add, of course, that artistic practice uh, 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 maximizes all these characteristics. For example, poetic texts are designed to facilitate the adoption of a divergent style of attention, and reading a poem by adopting a convergent style would, in fact, destroy it. Uh, there's one uh, aspect which perhaps nicely catches a sort of resume of all these aspects. That's the often noticed fact that you cannot replace uh, the aesthetic experience of whatever it is by a summary or by a paraphrase. To experience remembrance of things lost by Proust, you have to read the whole novel. No summary will do. Of course, a summary or a paraphrase can give you important facts, perhaps even the most important information about the representational content of Proust works. But experiencing the work aesthetically is to experience it not only as representing a world, a fictional world, if you want, but incarnating this world verbally in precisely the form Proust gave it. To elicit the same experience, you would have to copy it. The same holds true for aesthetic experiences relating to natural phenomena, for example. No description of a landscape can replace the experience in its singularity as experienced by an individual. Of course, the description of a landscape can itself be the object of an aesthetic experience. But in this sense, the experience is tied to the description and not to the landscape, landscape which is described, at least not directly. I think there are many other uh, aspects which uh, uh, would, it would be interesting to dwell, dwell upon, but I would like to go on and say some words about the second uh, aspect of uh, aesthetic uh, experience, which is the hedonic component. If my hypothesis is correct, correct, then aesthetically inflected attention very often seems to be more costly than standard attention. So why would we engage in such a costly information processing? As I suggested earlier, in aesthetic experience, the uh, process is regulated by hedonic feedback. Of course, most 
if not all, cognitive processes are tied to hedonic reactions, positive or negative. What then is the difference? I think we saw that standard attention is regulated mostly by its final outcome, so it is heavily heteroteleological. Aesthetically oriented attention is, on the contrary, we saw self teleological because, in its case, the hedonic calculus is functioning online in a feedback loop with the ongoing attention. Demonstrating the existence of such a direct online feedback loop between attention and reward in aesthetic experience has been the aim of several experiments by the cognitive psychologist Rolf Reba and uh, his team. I don't know if I. Right, okay. Reba and his uh, colleagues' empirical evidence is mostly behavioral. Also, Piotr Winkelmann and John Cacioppo used facial electromyography, EMG, as a way to measure per participants' effective response. But I think their findings are corroborated by neuroscientific research, such as that of Ramachandran, Hirstein, the team of Semyazeki, and others, who identified uh, areas uh, as the place which, mediating, which are mediating between this uh, mediating, sorry, this feedback in the case of experiences of visual, at least, and musical beauty and ugliness. One possible difference between the psychological model of Reba and his colleagues and uh, some neuroscientific models is that Reba's experimental work is concerned with establishing a difference between hedonic value attributed to uh, the processing itself. Reba's experiment aimed to highlight the fact that in aesthetic contexts, pleasure and displeasure is a reaction to the process of attention, which implies that although the properties of the object of attention are an important part of the distal cause of aesthetic appreciation, its proximal cause would be the ongoing attentional activity itself. For Reba and his colleagues, what is rewarding during the, or not rewarding if it's negative, during the experience is not the represented object as such in a direct way, nor, of course, the final cognitive outcome of the processing, but the act of processing itself, which in fact reminds us of the Kantian harmony of the faculties. I th think that perhaps neuroscientists tend generally to relate the hedonic response more directly to the properties of the attended object. Another Perhaps the difference is that neuroscientists very often address issues in art where perception is central, whereas Reba's uh, model um, pretends to be uh, correct also for the domain of literature, uh, uh, where direct perception is only a preparation for the aesthetic uh, relationship, uh, but also for conceptual art and more generally for many forms of contemporary art where the perceptual level of attentional engagement is not always the most important. In Reba's uh, model, the three points are, uh, I think, interesting. First, he thinks that it is the attentional, as I said, that it is the attentional process which is evaluated by the hedonic calculus and not the object in a direct way. Although, the appreciation will generally be projected on the processed object. Second point, this implies for Reba and his uh, colleagues that the evaluation is in, in important ways meta-representational and reflective. And finally, also according to this model, the feedback is operating in the two directions and the hedonic evaluation is done online. Can we go further and find out if there are specific characteristics of the prof profile of, attentional, of the attention process, which are in a deterministic or more probably probabilistic way linked to positive or negative hedonic valence, and therefore to positive or negative aesthetic experience. If you adopt Reba's uh, model, the relevant characteristic should be a characteristic of the processing itself. So what could be this characteristic? In fact, the standard answer given in cognitive psychology to this question has been for a long time that it is fluency, fluency of processing, which is the hedonic regulator. I may put something on the PowerPoint there. 
The more the processing is experienced as fluent, the more the aesthetic experience will be positive according to this interpretation. This would imply that the only variable on which the hedonic calculus of valence draws is fluency or easiness of processing. This has notably been the initial explanation given by Rolf Reber and his colleagues. But this conclusion has been considered by many critics of Reber to be counterintuitive. The first objection comes from art history. If fluency uh, was the end of the story, how could we explain that many and even perhaps most works of art, and especially many highly respected ones, are designed intentionally, at least partly, so as to limit fluency of processing. It is the case, as I said, with many types of poetry, even classical poetry. It is the case also with many principles of musical structuring and also in many uh, paintings and so on. Not to talk about uh, conceptual art or uh, contemporary art in general. To answer to this criticism, Reber has complexified his theory. In a recent paper which he co-authored with Nicolas Bulot, uh, he introduces the notion of disfluency. And he sees in disfluency, the contrary of fluency, he sees in disfluency an artistic strategy uh, aimed at manipulating fluency. As the two authors explicitly state, fluency remains the cause of the positive valence, which implies that disfluency is considered to be a source of negative hedonic valence. So why then should the artist be keen on introducing disfluency. Reba and Boulot think that the function of disfluency is instrumental for manipulating the type of engagement of the public. Disfluency can, I, I, citation, disfluency can elicit inferences about the artwork and a more analytical style of processing in appreciators who adopt the design stance, design in the form of the intentional stand, intent, intentionalist stance, and acquire art historical understanding. End of the citation. Later on they state, Johan, for instance, artists may aim to elicit processing disfluency in order to prevent automatic identification of the content of a work, or elicit thoughts about issues that are culturally significant in their art historical context. If we follow the association of the expression automatic identification, we could be tempted to identify disfluency to the, what the Russian, Russian formalists called defamiliarization. But in fact, disfluency is not the same thing as defamiliarization. Whereas the Russian formalists thought that the uh, process of defamiliarization sorry, necessarily is necessary to uphold satisfying aesthetic experiences, Reber and Bulot think that its aim is to compel the public to go beyond the basic exposure stance, the stance of the naive spectator, so to say, and to take into account the design stance, that means the personal and historical intentionality, and the artistic understanding stance. As Reber and Bulot state, the more analytical style of processing which we engage in culminates in an historical interpretation of the native signification of the artwork. But adopting this, position, this stance of historical analysis and interpretation seems to me to be different from adopting the aesthetic stance. Of course, intentional and historical information generally or always inform aesthetic experience. But this information is better seen as being a part of the input or of the background of the aesthetically oriented attention than as a part of the experience itself, that is, of the processing uh, of the object or event which is the focus of attention. If the function of disfluency is of this, the kind Reber and Bulot say, I am not sure that it will resolve the problems encountered by the theory of fluency because it displaces the problem from the processing to the plane of the background information for the experience. There exists a second objection, and I'll finish by that, to the fluency theory, which could perhaps show us another way out of the problem. This second objection comes from psychology. Several studies have shown that the attractiveness, attractiveness sorry, of fluency has a boundary condition. And this boundary condition uh, is known. It is boredom. You get bored when a signal is too fluent. So normally, if fluency was the only factor, we should think that the more fluent 
the great as a satisfaction. But in fact, from a certain level of fluency on, you see that the graphic is going down the other way around, and it will be uh, unsatisfactory. This is perhaps an indication that fluency alone cannot be the whole story and suggests the existence of the second factor capable of counterbalancing fluency. What could be this element? One plausible candidate which has been um, uh, put forward would be curiosity. Artworks in this way must not only be beautiful, they must also be interesting. That is, they must stimulate curiosity. So a tentative hypothesis would, could be that positive hedonic feedback is the result of fluency and curiosity counterbalancing each other. Now, curiosity is a notion that is somewhere difficult to assess in psychological terms. Although, although sorry, it presupposes a state of lack of information, it is characterized by a, uh, and, and is characterized sorry, by a drive to reduce the information gap. It is not contrary to disfluency experienced as dysphoric, but on the contrary, it is associated with positive feelings. The, this inherent positive hedonic valence of curiosity has perhaps been shaped by biological evolution because curiosity is a fitness enhancing quality. But whatever the evolutionary cause, the re reality of the positive hedonic valence of curiosity seems to be well established. So in what way could curiosity go together with fluency to enhance the positive hedonic value of an aesthetic experience? I think it is important to notice that the two factors have not the same status. Fluency and disfluency are two opposing experiences of processing dynamics. Disfluency being generally experienced simply as that which hinders fluency. Curiosity is not an experience in this sense. It is a mental attitude or disposition opposed to that of lack of interest. And lack of interest, as I said, is provoked among others by being bored, which, as we have seen, is a limiting condition for experiencing fluency positively. So curiosity is an attitude of positive cognitive alertness for stimuli, objects, events, not yet processed or only partly processed. The positive valence depends not on the nature of the stimuli, but it is tied to the simple fact that they are as yet not processed or only partly processed. This means that curiosity values the act of processing uh, information as such, which is precisely what should be the case in the aesthetic experience. Löwenstein, uh, but also uh, Larodi and Schmidt, I don't know if I have, yeah, if we find some, uh, argue more specifically that in its purest forms, curiosity is characterized by a self teleological drive. When we are curious, we are uh, valuing information in itself independently of any specific cognitive or pragmatic reward. This means that the reward of curiosity lies in the going on of processing itself. If this tentative outline uh, was correct, then we could say that artists are not obliged to construe traps of disfluency to maintain the positive interest in the art lover. They have to get him to become and then to stay interested in processing the object, the work of art. That is, the work must be rich in the sense of opening up the possibility of an intense and open-ended processing. This means, among other things, that it must be complex. And as Reber himself, among other, noticed, if people value fluency in a positive way, they nevertheless prefer complexity over simplicity. So if curiosity was a factor of the dynamics of positive aesthetic evaluation, this would be what we should wait for. All this would not mean that fluency is not important, but only that on its own it cannot explain positive aesthetic value. It seems to me that a model based on the tensional interplay between fluency and curiosity is what we should look for. I'm not sure that the descriptive and explanatory outlines I have sketched here really fit together to draw an integrated portrait of aesthetic experience but it seems to me at least that they constitute a possible starting ground if you want to gain a better understanding of it. The difficulties which remain, I know it very well, are of course numerous. But perhaps if the psychological description I presented here could help us to understand better the internal, internal dynamics of aesthetically oriented attention. But 
and I'll finish on that sentence, it tells us nothing about the social and cultural factors which shape the attribution of hedonic valences and, of course, the attentional processes themselves. It can be argued, and I would agree with this argument, that the most complex problems we have to face uh, in social sciences when we are talking about aesthetics are those concerning the level of a correct understanding of the way social and cultural factors shape our attention and our allotment of positive or negative hedonic valence. But that will be for another day, I suppose. Thank you very much.